Um, unfortunately, Nick hasn't been able to come today. He was on the program, as you've seen, so he very kindly actually recorded this presentation for us. So we're going to have Nick, I think as he was last night, <laughs> making this available. Nick, can you find it? Hi, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about rights and responsibility when it comes uh, to accessibility. Um, we often hear that people with disabilities have a right to access and we'll explore that a little bit. But first, uh, for those who don't know me, uh, a little bit of background about me. I've been doing web accessibility for a very long time now. I started in the mid-1990s and it's something that's been interesting me all along. Um, you can find my website where I blog at incl.ca. I run a podcast where I talk with people involved in one way or another with web accessibility, and that, that's at a11yrules.com. And I am currently working with uh, Nobility, a nonprofit based in Austin, Texas, and we do accessibility. That's the uh, our raison d'être, the, the reason for our being. So why am I interested in rights and responsibilities? Um, it, it actually goes back quite a long time. When I was a kid, a very, very tiny, long, young kid, my father used to listen to songs like the Internationale, a French revolutionary song. Um, some of the lyrics of that song says that Equality wants other laws, no right without duties, she says. Equally, no duties without rights. I think that's, that's something that's quite important. Um, it, it framed my thinking about accessibility in, in many ways. Uh, people with disabilities, we demand a right to access. And I think that that's, that's fair enough. We, we should be able to get in where we want to go. We should be able to access website, access content. At the same time, we have a responsibility to make that happen. It's not just something that happens out of the blue. We can't just sit back and say, oh, all right, we're done. No, we, we have a right to access and, and that's it. So who has rights? Well, everyone. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the point, but uh, it's not just about people with disabilities that have a right to accessibility. It's also about developers who have a right to information. It's about site owners. It's about QA testers. It's about anyone involved with the web, because we're talking about the web primarily today, but it's about everyone uh, having some rights in making it happen. Um, of course, when we're talking about rights, as I just said, we're also talking about who has responsibilities, right? And, and well, <laughs> I'm going to say again, uh, just like everybody has rights, everybody has responsibilities. We can all be superheroes. We can all make things happen, but we all have a duty to speak up and a duty to listen. And that's a problem that I've found. Uh, I've been involved with the disability community for a long time now, uh, nearly 25 years. And I've found that a lot of people with disabilities just don't speak up. We come across a website that doesn't work and we don't tell the site owners. We don't provide feedback. We move on. We don't say anything. We just kind of go, oh, hell, another website that's not working for me. Or we go on Twitter and we say, hey, this site doesn't work. Or we tell people around us that we didn't have a good experience. Um, and sometimes we scream in frustration and we want to throw our laptop out the window. So there, there's all these reactions, but often people with disabilities just don't speak up. Don't give the feedback to the people that actually might be able to make a change. I'm saying we must speak up. We really have to make a point of telling stakeholders there's a problem and where the problem is. Um, 
you know, I think it was uh, Gandhi that said, we have to be the change we want to see in the world. So paraphrasing that a little bit, we have to take action to help change happen. Um, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, we say, if you don't vote in the elections, you can't complain about your government. Well, it's, it's the same thing. If you, if you have issues on the web and you don't speak up, well, in some ways, you should not complain that the web is not accessible. And it might sound like I'm giving a serve to people with disabilities, and maybe in a, in a way I am, but that's that's really not the point. I think it's it's got to be a balanced view. Um, and I say that because, from my own experience, I know that often giving feedback feels pointless. It's a little bit like you have a door in the middle of a field, a gate in the middle of a field, but there's no fence around the, the, the gate, so there's it kind of feels pointless. Uh, we often provide feedback and it feels pointless because the complaint don't go anywhere, we uh, don't hear back, we sometimes hear, hey, yeah, that's a good point, uh, thank you for raising it, and then nothing happens after three months, a year, two years. Uh, sometimes we're being told it's too expensive to fix. There, there's a whole series of reasons that we hear routinely for why a site is not going to become more accessible. So that kind of builds quite a bit of frustration. Um, you want to bang your head against a brick wall, right? Um, well, I know I do sometimes. Uh, even as a developer, as an accessibility expert, as someone who's been in the inside, the experience can be frustrating. Um, I have a lot of stories that I could tell, but I'm not going to dig into that because I don't want to point fingers. I think we can all recognize ourselves in having experiences that are frustrating, whether in terms of providing feedback or in terms of trying to make things happen from the inside. Now, for those of you developers out there, uh, remember that when you get feedback, not everyone is an expert on all the things. Um, most people with disabilities know very little about accessibility at large. Uh, we tend to know what works for us. Uh, for example, if I use a ramp, because I've had training in building accessibility, I know what a ramp should be. Uh, I know that uh, in most of the world, the gradient should be 1 in 12. Uh, in Australia, 1 in 15, so it's, it's a little bit less steep. Uh, so I know what that works, but I've heard people wheelchair users say, hey, this ramp is too steep, it's not accessible, when in fact it was correct in terms of meeting standards. It's the same thing on the web. We, um, we know what we know, we know what works for us, but unless we have training and experience in accessibility, we might not actually be able to say, hey, your site is not accessible because, and then list a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, so it's, it's something to keep in mind that as a person with disability giving feedback, you know what you know and you know that very well. You know what assistive technology works for you and you probably can give fairly pointed feedback on that uh, front, but you don't know everything else around it, likely. And when you receive feedback, it's it's the same thing. Uh, you know, if someone tells you, oh, this doesn't work for me, it doesn't necessarily mean that the site is not accessible for sighted keyboard only user if it's uh, feedback about screen reader users. It can be uh, different. So another aspect is that um, we often see requests for feedback. Um, I, a developer once told me, um, I asked for help on Twitter, but as usual, when I asked for accessibility help, nobody answered. Honestly, blind people suck that way. If someone building a ramp asks my opinion, I will be overjoyed to go over there and test it. Blind people will not help test websites, ever. 
Now this was a developer with a disability, a wheelchair user, and he couldn't find people to test. At the same time, he was not willing to pay for testers to actually do tests, and that becomes a, a problem. Uh, see, the thing is, people with disabilities, we're in high demand. We have a flood of requests to help. Hey, can you check my website? Just spend two minutes or just spend five minutes, except it's never just two minutes. It's never just five minutes. It always turns out to be longer because you say, uh, I don't know, I can't see the focus when I'm using the keyboard on your site. And then the developer wants to know more or understand a little bit why it's an issue. And then when you have that request come through once or twice or maybe three, four, five times a day, uh, it can become quite time intensive. So yeah, we're in high demand. And it's a vicious circle. You know, people with disabilities can't be bothered. Devs don't want to know. We have to break that vicious circle. Uh, as developers, we have to want to know. And as people with disabilities, we have to be bothered because in the end, accessibility will benefit everyone. Let's get into some suggestions, uh, s things that stakeholders can actually do to help themselves on the path of understanding accessibility a bit more. So the first thing is learn about it, learn about accessibility. Um, I was talking to uh, someone on the podcast, uh, Sina Baram, who was telling me something that really resonated. He said, we don't have an accessibility problem, we have an awareness problem. And I think that's the issue here. We have people that actually don't know about accessibility. So that, that's the first thing that you as a stakeholder can do. And it's not just developers, it's designers. There's a whole range of things designers can do to improve accessibility from the get-go. It's project managers. They have to understand where and when and how to implement accessibility in the project. And, and by the way, that should be from the start. Uh, it's site owners. Site owners have to understand about accessibility and learn a little bit about that. Um, the other thing is invite feedback. Make it easy for people with disabilities to contact you and say, there's a problem. If it's going to take five minutes or 10 minutes to struggle through a website to find your contact information, you're not going to hear from people with disabilities uh, and, and provide multiple ways to um, to give that feedback. It, it's got to be easy. Make it available from the front page. Make it available as maybe a link to Twitter, maybe a direct link to an email address and maybe a form and maybe as well um, a phone number. Provide multiple ways for people to be able to get to you and, and provide that feedback. Spend some time and listen to it. Don't just blow it off. Don't, don't ignore it. Just if you're getting feedback, if someone with a disability, as we discussed, they have quite a few demands on their time in terms of giving feedback about accessibility. So if someone thinks it's important enough to take the time to give you feedback, the least you can do is listen to that feedback and then deliver on your promise. Um, it's very frustrating to be told, we'll fix it, but weeks later or months later, nothing's moving. Um, for example, um, a very specific example, Tweetbot, uh, a Twitter client, has had the ability to add alt text to their photos and their roadmap for three years now and nothing is changing uh, so when people contact them and they say yeah we're gonna fix it it's on our roadmap we're working on it and you don't see any movement it gets very frustrating and and you don't want to be that that organization that says yeah we're gonna do something about it and then you just brush it under the, the rug and don't do anything about it of course, 
perhaps the most important things is uh, remove those barriers. Uh, do a self-audit, look at it, don't wait for feedback. Go through your site. Um, there's a whole thing, series of things you can do. You know, do keyboard testing, that's gonna give you a real indication. Run through color contrast analyzer, run through uh, forms, use automated testing tools if you need to because you don't really know how to do testing. Do the little things that will make a difference, that will help you identify the barriers, help you remove the barriers. Um, conduct usability testing, and, and not just usability testing, but specific disability accessibility testing. Um, hire and pay people with disabilities uh, to do testing. People with all kinds of disabilities, not just um, expert users. Uh, you, you can't get away with asking one screen reader power user and get them to run through your site and then they don't find anything so hey we're accessible it, it, you have to have a variety um, and if you don't know where to get people with disabilities for user testing I'm gonna plug in access works which is a service that uh, nobility provides we have a bank of hundreds of people with disabilities of various abilities uh, and knowledge on the web so we can uh, we can help with that but there's other groups out there as well now that I've given a few ideas for stakeholders uh, let's look at what people with disabilities can do uh, how we can make it a little bit easier on ourselves to be able to provide feedback so the first thing is speak up you see a site tell the owner tell the developers something's wrong it's not working um, one of the things that I've noticed is very often in large organizations there are people within the organization that are accessibility champions, internal advocates that are wanting to improve the situation from within but without the support from people with disabilities out there their voice is a little bit um, unheard. It's difficult for them to make a difference because often leadership is going to say but why should we spend time and energy and resources and money on this? Because nobody out there needs accessibility. There's no metrics to measure who is who needs accessibility and who doesn't. So um, by speaking up, you will provide help to the people inside to make changes. Chances are, as a person with disability, if you provide feedback about a barrier you are encountering yourself chances are it's pretty much going to be the same thing or the same things similar things uh, from one side to another so you can build yourself a template uh, just an email where you plug in some of the information you can have everything just typed up and change a few things um, you can say uh, things about uh, ha I had a problem on your page. Be specific which page, which URL. Uh, describe what you were doing. So I tried to navigate through the menu with my keyboard only. Describe the problem. What works, what doesn't work. Uh, explain the impact. I was not able to add the $1,500 uh, item in the shopping cart and as a result I could not purchase this item from you make it clear what you wanted to do and what wasn't able to work uh, if you're able to give information as to how to diagnose or fix so describe your computer your operating system assistive technologies if you use some um, and then you can give people a resource and I like the W3C's resource uh, with uh, standards and, and the web accessibility initiative the Y website um, so with a template be specific and that will speed up your your ability to to do things so you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time do take a minute but no more than a minute so use your template go through it quickly don't just bitch 
Don't say, hey, your website sucks. I can't use it. Provide constructive criticism. Uh, elaborate on what the issues are and how, in your experience, things could be fixed. Um, because, in general, people react better to constructive criticism than uh, aggressive diatribes, right? So, um, that really wraps up the um, presentation. Uh, there is usually time for questions, but I'm not on site right now, so I invite you to contact me either by email or on Twitter. Uh, let's continue this conversation on Twitter because I'm sure you will have questions or comments or you, you, as a person with disability you're gonna say, oh Nick, why are you saying this? And as a developer you're gonna say, oh well maybe there's too much to be done. So let's continue this conversation uh, on Twitter. I can be reached at Vavroom, V-A-V-R-O-O-M, or if you want to send me a quick email, nic at nobility.org, that's K-N-O-W-B-I-L-I-T-I dot O-R-G. A fantastic opening talk. Now the fun thing is that Nick is actually available right now, so you can catch him on Twitter and that would be great, or any of the other things as well. Um, I wondered if there are comments that people want to make within the room, though, to other people. Has anyone got a comment? I can't see very well now. Yep. Vivian. We need a mic. Where's the mic? No, you must use a mic. Thank you. I found um, Nick's comment about the, um, the template really interesting and I, I'm thinking that perhaps we could look at Aussie Way about sort of working with the idea of a template that we distribute and um, having it such that it's, you know, through the Aussie Way community that somebody associated with the community or knows us would be able to um, use that template and we can distribute it through our own networks and make it sort of a, a very clear method and a very positive method in which to contact website owners. I think that's an excellent idea actually and I think what would do is give us some chance of seeing how prevalent particular problems are and so on. So it would also help us actually understand other people. Um, any other comments? Yes? Sean. Is there a mic just there? Um, I just wanted to mention that that, that template is already available online on the, um, on the W3C site, so the, the link was underneath on the slide. Um, so I, I mean I'm not sure if there's much uh, point in repeating that template, because it looks like a good template, but so maybe it could be, there could, just, could be a link to there from, um, from on the um, Vivian, what do you think about that? Uh, the only reason why we might do it is that it might help people look at what's happening on Australian sites, but otherwise I'd, I, I agree with you. But would it help to have a local one or would it not make much difference anyway? Yeah, I think that, well, perhaps we can talk to, and we can always talk to W3 about how to do that and share that with the way thing. So perhaps we could channel those ones that come into um, way back to us with copies or something. So let's follow that up. Very good idea. Andrew. Um, as the author of that template. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Ray for Australia. <laughs> Uh, it, uh, it did take an Australian flavour rather than a North American flavour, even though it was written by, uh, well, had to be uh, approved by a committee. Mm -hmm. um, the email is, it's a template for people to send to the owner of the website. That whole page actually t gives you some ideas about how you might find the owner, because often it's very difficult to find who to email things to and explains why you need to... Um, to, to somebody who wants to make a complaint, why you really need to put these things into your email if you possibly can. Not everybody would be able to, but it explains you know, why people want to know what browser you're using, what technology you're using, 
what the URL was and so on, so that people understand why it's quite a long template. Now we all understand why Aussie Way has such a reputation for fantastic work. Andrew, uh, two questions for that, I think. One is, um, I think it would be therefore really worth putting something together for Aussie Way and distributing it to people, explaining that this facility is available and so on, um, and to point to it, so that would be good. Is there a way we could, uh, if, if I make a comment as, as Nick's suggesting, and it goes to the um, website people, can it also come to Aussie Way, or is it a confidential issue, or what's the problem there? We, we make Jerry run. <laughs> we need to go to the gym for a while. <laughs> um, so the idea is that that uh, email actually goes to the um, website owner, it doesn't go to W3C, but there's no reason why we couldn't um, encourage them to CC if we wanted them to. Um, I think it would be very interesting, way. wouldn't it, for people to see what are the common problems occurring in our context. Um, I mean, the, the other people they might want to see, uh, CC might be the Human Rights Commission. Well then, I would suggest, can we ask Vivian and a couple of other people perhaps who are interested to get together with Vivian and see if we can uh, get the information with Andrew Preps and find out how, and there's another comment coming. Yeah. Hi, and I'm, I'm conscious, Sean, it's Renata, I'm stealing the microphone time for you just for a second. Um, but just to build off that point, I think one thing that Lainey Feingold, when she was in Australia recently, talked about, um, and she's a, a lawyer who processes a lot of cases through structured negotiation, is that people sometimes get very defensive uh, if you do copy in or say that you're going to be including the committee. Not to say that it's not a great suggestion, um, but to, um, to say we need to maybe sometimes be careful. And I think, Nick, I love the thought of saying that people, developers, sometimes they, they just aren't aware. So if it's an awareness issue, sometimes it's about raising it. When it becomes multiple people, though, having to raise the same issue over and over, I think that template idea is brilliant. Love, Andrew, that you've done that. I do also think there's scope, though, to have potentially multiple templates. So maybe there's one for the developer, maybe there's one for the CEO, maybe there's one for, has this website been developed by a group of web providers, in which case, can, how do you track down who's providing all of these websites and raise their awareness? But I think the point of a template was to make it something that could be done quickly. Yes, It starts precisely. to become, I have to spend hours and hours working out how to do it. I, I, I am aware of the, the sensitivity issue, and that's why I think if we, Andrew will know a fair bit about that from his experience, I've no doubt. Yes, so um, I'll, But I'll, generally, I'll, it, it seems like a good thing to investigate. Please raise your hand if you think it's, it, it sounds like it could be useful to people. So, okay, there's a task for Aussie Way. The next Aussie Way committee has already got its first task. Fantastic. Um, were there other comments about what uh, Nick had to say? I had, I had one comment in relation to what Nick was referring to is in the PWD world is that but there's two points I'll, I'll talk about. Um, the PWD world, there's a lot of people who don't have the self-confidence to do it. Yep. Um, due to many reasons, uh, and even some have just got time poor, or you know, can't, due to the fact that they, they don't have the, either don't have the skills or don't have the confidence or don't, or don't have the time to actually focus on, the, on that. The other issue in relation to the template side of thing is ceasing to another organisation uh, like either way is, is that from a vendor point of view it's confidential information so if it's going into the organisation referring to that uh, issues in the organisation you have to be careful of that side of, side of thing. Exactly so it may be that there's certain things that need to be stripped off I mean if, if what's happening with lots of um, organisations is a common problem maybe there's a way we can look at the template and actually get some information without knowing which particular um, websites are causing the problem. I don't know. It's a, I think that's a, it's a thing worth thinking about. But yeah, there are clearly little uh, scary things in there. Lainey Feingold, that was referred to before, is very interesting. Her approach to dealing with this as a lawyer who could have set up business, let, let's rip everyone off when they make a mistake, works on the basis of, oh, look, this, this organisation has put together a dreadful website. Isn't that a terrible thing? What a wonderful opportunity to show them how to make it better. And in fact, then to enter into negotiations with people who make bad mistakes rather than to uh, chase them for it. 
and it's a very successful approach. And I think that's something I want to talk about again on Friday, but I think it's something that Aussie Way could do in a very interesting way. I happen to chair the Disability Discrimination Law Service in uh, Victoria, and one of the things we don't really do is have a lot of opportunity to deal with these things as we should. And I think if Aussie Way were able to put together the professional view of uh, what might be done to that website to make it more accessible, when we're alerted as the Disability Discrimination Group to a problem with the website, we might find, as Laney has, a better path to the future. And that would be lawyers being helpful rather than hindering. But the lawyers don't know about accessibility, and most of us in accessibility steer clear of the law, don't we? <laughs> Hi. Um... Okay. Hi, Jocelyn Dart here um, from SOP. So I just wanted to say it's great. I, I love the template and it's great to see it. Uh, I, I loved exactly what it was saying. One comment though, um, this is focused on websites and I know historically that has been the focus, but these days most people are dealing with apps. Uh, I think with a very small change, which is at least tell us which device you're on, that would be really helpful uh, when reporting it, those sorts it, of It does ask like that, in fact. Oh, um, okay, that, that. I just want to pick that up because the Aussie Way is very old. When the web started, it was the web of things. We've now gone through 20 years and we've managed to get back to begin thinking about linking up things and that means your refrigerator and your oven. But I think this idea that it's only web pages, certainly Aussie Way is about digital inclusion as I see it. It's about bringing everyone in. And quite often that extends outside of the digital thing as well. It might extend into a physical space. So yeah, that's something that, and that's one of the reasons I suggested the Scratch Challenge. It's not a web page as such, although it is. It's, it's a whole world that's shut off. Any more comments? Uh, just. Uh to pick up on what Nick said about uh, the responsibilities of people who have disabilities. Sean mentioned that some people aren't confident to, to make a comment. Um, I wrote a paper some years ago called Building Assertiveness in People Who Have Disabilities. And um, I mean, unfortunately, we often are told to sit down and shut up and be grateful. And, <laughs> and I think it's important that, that people develop assertiveness. It's also, in terms of responsibility, important that I develop my skills with the equipment so that I use it effectively. And I'll say a little bit about this tomorrow morning, but a whole lot of people who are using this technology have very limited knowledge of how to use it correctly uh, or efficiently. And then they find that things don't work. Uh, and that's, that's a very major concern of mine. Um, somehow we have to help people to, to get the most out of their equipment. And I don't expect everyone to be a geek like, like me, um, but, but they really, you know, people could do a lot better if they knew more about how to use the gear. Thank you. So it's not a them situation, it's about us. We are all of the people, those with skills, those without, whatever, it's about everybody. I think Nick captures it well when he says it's about having responsibility and, and uh, adopting those. Jerry, we're, we're going, going like this because guess what? It's morning tea time. Now, just to remind you, coming, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're, I would like to welcome our next speaker and that is Scott Avery. So please welcome Scott to the floor. Thank you. Just whilst we get sorted, um, my talk's going to be on inclusion, and I, I do see a few people up the back there. Um, we'd just like you to invite you to the front uh, if you'd like to. Um, I'm told by the organisers that uh, the sound is much better. Um, I'm deaf, I don't really know, but I'll take their word for it. So. Um, so by all means, you won't offend me if you come a bit closer while I start talking. Uh, Gujigu, um, 
which is hello and welcome in my native language of Gatang. Uh, I'm an Aboriginal man from the Waramai mob. Um, so Waramai, if you're driving from Sydney to Brisbane, you cross the Karoo River and before you hit the Manning River, that's where my um, ancestral home is. Uh, I'd just also like to acknowledge uh, being an Aboriginal person, you, you come on other people's country and we had a very warm welcome to Gadigal land this morning. And I'd just like to acknowledge my um, thoughts are with the traditional owners of the land on which we're here today. So, um, and being an Aboriginal person talking here, you always get a sense that you are on people's land and, and there's ancestors floating in the room now. So, and it's for us to listen to them. So, um, my name is Scott Avery. So I work with an organisation called the First People's Disability Network. So we're a not-for-profit organisation, so a community-based organisation. And by that I mean we are made up entirely of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with disability. So everyone on our board has um, a disability of some sort and is Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. So we're not a service provider and we're not a government and we're not affiliated with the university in any way. We're really a people's organisation. And, and the reason that we exist is um, when we, when we come to conferences and we read things um, about what are the views of Aboriginal people or people with disability and both, often we find that what we hear and see and read falls a bit short of what we are, what we, what we really value. Um, and it comes to this notion, I said, I was actually a bit daunted when I got the invitation here, it was this web accessibility and I'm going, you know, compared to you guys, I'm probably a bit of a Luddite. I like my books and all that kind of stuff. So what am I going to say here? So I'm really going to talk about this broader concept of access, but more about understanding access in relation to how people can be isolated in communities. So more so than the technical side or providing physical access. So I'm going to talk a lot about some of the work that we do when we go out to remote communities. And we're actually talking to some of the most marginalised, isolated people you could probably imagine in Australia. And in that respect, because I am the Luddite in the room, it comes up with a dare because I'll be talking about things which actually might be quite provocative and make you think about things when you're providing things to a person or trying to reach a person, that there are bigger, um, that there's this bigger notion of isolation and access in your mind. So I should point out also, I said earlier, that I'm actually profoundly deaf. So um, often when I go to remote communities, I have to point it out. So this thing here, it's a, a cochlear implant and um, I often when I go to Aboriginal communities I have to kind of tell people that because um, one of the things about technology is it doesn't always make its way into remote communities. So I didn't really run into people with hearing aids or, or uh, cochlear implants when I went out there and often they're a bit standoffish and I'd go, oh no, no, no mate, I'm, 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 I'm deaf. And they go, oh you're deaf, thank God for that. I thought you're a copper. <laughs> so it's handy to have that in mind. And it's funny if you think about technology struggling to make its way into some of the more remote parts. But this concept of maybe the coppers, they understand that and that kind of fear and loathing can. So just be mindful of that when you're thinking about designing solutions which you're looking at hard to reach. If you really want to understand, now we're coming from an Aboriginal culture, I want to put this uh, cultural overlay on, on what isolation and inclusion means. If you want to think about uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with disability, what you actually need to do is cast your mind back 25,000 years. So out in, uh, there's an archaeological site in western New South Wales around Lake Mungo. And it's one of the largest uh, and oldest archaeological sites in terms of having footprints of ancient tribes out there. And amongst the footprints, there's all these footprints out there, and there's one set of footprints. It's a single right line of footprint. So right footprint, right footprint, right footprint, with no corresponding left footprint. And because all the archaeological um, people, you know, all the scientists and that scratching their head, they've measured it and going, oh, it don't make sense of that. 
Then they asked the Aboriginal uh, community, the elders, and they said, what's that? And they said, well, that's a one-legged man on a hunt. And he's actually moving at pace, and he's actually on the hunt with the clan. And um, it's very consistent with how we see disability in Aboriginal communities. We actually don't see disability, funnily enough. It's much more normalised. Culturally, it's actually more close to this notion of inclusion. So this notion of a one-legged man, it's actually part of saying, yeah, actually, we'll take all comers. So again, I'm deaf. Someone might say I'm a little bit dinbin, which roughly in Gadigal language translates to dead ear. So it means I've got a dead ear. But it's not used in the pejorative way. It's just saying, look, you just need, might, might need to throw something if you want my attention to get his attention. But it doesn't attract that deficit concept that you might see when you're talking about disability and the stigmas and all that are attached to that. Um, so uh, what happened is when, when 250 years ago white fellas came, not only did they bring around a lot of, many people might know about what's happened around the dispossession of Aboriginal people from the land, but one thing they did, which doesn't get talked a lot of lot, is they brought this social order in. And one of the things they introduced was this concept of disability. And the notion of that someone might be disabled. A disabled person actually, you can trace it back to the Industrial Revolution where all these technical process came of production. We're going to streamline everything. And people became commodities in that process. And if you didn't fit the standard specification, well, we'll cast you aside. And that's a social order that got port imported into Australia in the late 1700s, early. It was actually an experiment called the Enlightenment period at that time. And that's this concept that, oh, well, hang on, you're othered, you're othered, you're out there. So it's not a technical definition when you think it. You've actually got to think, well, this is this social order and this is empowerment. And one of the things when you lose power is the notion of you might have a voice but you might not have a platform through which your voice is heard. So one of the things that we actually set out to do is actually to get the voice of people. And it's actually to go out and say, okay, we're just going to sit there. We're not going to come with you with a predetermined question. We're not going to ask you whether our website works. We're going to ask you whether this feature works for you. We're not doing that. What we're going to do is we're just going to sit with you and we'll ask one thing. What is your story? So it starts with the person's story. And it's not bound, it's not bounded in any way, shape or form. It's in their turf, it's on their terms, it's in their time. They can take five minutes, they can take an hour and a half. Point was, we just wanted to hear from them on their terms and to facilitate that. And this is a model that we kind of use here. So we use things, is we, the, the center bit's testimony. So when we go out and we say, tell us your story, often when we, we use that language, because language is very important, people go, oh, stories, you know, might be made up or something like that. I said, we talk about it as testimony. It's like you're going to court. It's like a truth. There's an embedded truth. And some of the things, as I've been listening to the first couple of speakers today, and some of the barriers that people with disability or Aboriginal people, particularly if, it, if you bring the two together, um, it's that notion of, it's, it's not that they're being listened to, it's, it's will they be believed? And it's actually a higher level. So we call these testimony. I said, but it's your story, you own it, we can't take it from you. So that's central. We also look at some data, because we also go, look, one person's story might be many, 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 many people's stories. So we do look at statistical data and saying, when we hear things and hear your story, is this amplified across a whole group? So we do map it with that. And the other thing is we look at, and we, this is a unique Aboriginal concept, it's called yarning. And that's that notion of, again, tell us your story, sit down in your set. And the people's the person's stories, how they connect with their environment, their land and that. So we use this concept of yarning through which you can actually let people just to share. Now, as I, you know, in, in our community, your Aboriginal and your Torres, uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander disability, if you bring those things together, I'm going to talk about a concept called intersectionality. So these things intersect. And it's more than I just happen to be both. What happens is if you're Aboriginal or you're a person with disability, your kind of social standing kind of is in reference to people who aren't either in those populations. If you bring those two things together, 
the forces that you face, the social exclusion you face, compound, across, and they compound across your life. And so you would experience things like, as an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander person, you might experience racism, and that might be at the personal level or, or systemic kind of racism. And if you're a person with disability, you might be experiencing ableism. So that might be personal again, so you get othered, you can't get jobs, or it might be systemic. What I mean by systemic is that take it for grantedness. Now, it's fantastic coming here because this is actually quite disability access place to present at. But I was at one last week and they constructed a, one of those aluminium stages. Didn't really need to, but it meant that I had to walk up on the stage. And I said, if I had a, a mobility impairment, I couldn't have done that. So I actually chose not to. I gave my presentation at the front. But it's that take it for grantedness that we need to challenge. Now, the thing is, if you're an Aboriginal person and you're a person with disability, it comes across and accumulates across your life. So it starts from birth. In many of the places you might go to in remote Australia, some of the things that a metropolitan a person living in a metropolitan area taking for granted, it's things like, you know, even some of the water supply, reliability and electricity, it's not there. Accessible housing, very, very hard to find in some of these places. So if you're a person with disability, what that does is that if, it just means that if you live in that and you're born in that environment, the chance that you might have a disability increases or if you have something, it's not picked up and that gets carried over into early childhood. So, and we know that Aboriginal children are 10 times more likely to be removed from their family and they don't tend to um, have assessments for these things because they live in an unstable family environment and service providers don't like doing that kind of thing because it dilutes their, their results. So you know, if you're an Aboriginal and you're in outer home care, where does it happen? So you might carry over into your school. And again, this notion, and we call it bad, bad black kid syndrome. And it's this concept that a punitive, isolating model starts from a very young age. And rather than thinking, how can I bring you in and think a person's disability or their social factors might be influencing their educational attainment, they punish it. And I just saw an article that was copied into me yesterday of a school in Canberra that actually has bars where they found an a child with autism sleeping. So this notion of we will exclude you and isolate you, it's conditioned, it's conditioned. And you carry that forward. So I know, and again, being, I keep going back to being deaf because I, I, I know this, I live some of this in my life, is I get really tired about two or three o'clock because the actual physical effort of hearing is quite difficult. You know, it's actually quite taxing if you're deaf. This helps, but doesn't fix it all. But it's actually quite taxing. So if you're talking to, I say to teachers, if, you're, if you're, you have a child who you know starts mucking up around two o'clock, one or two o'clock, they might have a disability. They mightn't be able to see the board. They mightn't be able to hear. They mightn't have had breakfast. This is this social thing that you, whilst you're focusing on doing your job, what you're trying to do, all this other stuff is happening around, which is inhibiting their access to what you're trying to do. So that's a point if you can start relating that. That's the dare I'm putting to you. I actually call this a matriculation pathway to prison. I imagine many of you are educated, have qualifications, degrees, diplomas, whatever. Think about your own pathway and how you might have gone from year 10 and did really well and that set you up for year 12 and year 12 you do well so you get to choose university courses well it's the opposite here so that notion of fulfillment is actually suppressed at any point because access to them they haven't been able to access that platform to go to the next stage because often the social forces have actually pushed them down and I call it a matriculation pathway to prison because they ended up in school or higher education or universities but if you look at the statistics, that's where they end up. They end up in juvenile detention or in prison. So again, this whole institutional forces we need to challenge, which are isolating and excluding people. Now, the, whilst that sounds very confronting and depressing to people, it also means that it's not inherent. This notion of being isolated is not inherent 
to me being an Aboriginal person with disability. It's all these social factors, all these social forces that are sucking me away from what I could be. That means you can change it. So you can look at this and going, at what point do I actually open up access in a way beyond me providing a technical or physical solution? Um, I'll just quickly talk about, now I know we're all web accessibility people, but this is a concept that I talk about how, and this concept applies, it, we got it from our sector, which is Aboriginal people with disability, but it actually talks about layering in isolation. If you have multiple, you're exposed to multiple vulnerabilities. So you might be um, from the ethnic community and a woman, or you might be from the um, gay community. This notion of you're marginalised in society. So I, I drew this, and this is real data from the health sector. And what it says, so on the extreme left-hand side, is how hard it is to access health services. So the far left-hand side is the general population. Okay, so everyone in the room here. So then you actually look at what happens if you're a person with disability or you're an Aboriginal person. So that's the second and third columns. And you see it gets harder to access the services. It goes up. The third one, I've overlaid the two. So you're an Aboriginal person and you have disability. It becomes harder again. So I call that intersectional inequality. So the two things intersecting. The third one, uh, the fifth one rather, is uh, the severity of the disability. So if you have severe and profound disability, it becomes harder again to access services. This is what the statistical data can show you. You can actually see this concept. And when we spoke to people, they told us their testimony, that rule applied as well. It's hard to show the testimony in a graph form. So I'll actually look at this. So this is a, a bit of an emblematic kind of picture for that we use. And it's a picture that I took in a remote community in the Northern Territory. And just off the side here, uh, if you're off the side of the picture, a group of people sitting around, they're amputees. So. But if you have a look, so the wheelchair here, is a fa if I was around here, around the city area, this wheelchair would be totally awesome. It's light, it folds up, you put it in the back of your car, on you go, and it's just really good on the, you know, it doesn't have that weight to it. You take that same solution that works here and you put it in a different environment which is far more hostile. And the environment that this is being used in, it's extreme heat, so Central Australian heat and no footpaths. And I'm just going to come over here and point something out and I'll come back. So if you have a look there, the, the, the rubber wheels had melted off. So what was thought to be a really good solution, designed in a sort of metropolitan setting, probably someone really great, has just, it just doesn't work. It's actually, it actually doesn't, it's actually inefficient. It's actually wasted, it's discarded. But this is also a metaphor for how we see person-centered approaches in an environment. So the wheelchair, you can see this as an image of a personal-centred approach. If I was in the disability centre, I'd call it the medical model. So it focuses on the person. And that situates the deficit in the person. The environment, the dust, no footpaths. And, and, and that model says, well, we can fix you. That's a message. The environment, that without the footpaths. So that's, that's the social setting, the environment there. Now what that does, that situates the problem or the deficit in the environment, not the person, but the environment. And that, the message that comes from that is we can accommodate you. Now the people sitting on the side, which comes back to our cultural inclusion, it's saying, well come sit with us. We will include you. So it's a different philosophy that we want to do and it's something that has to be practiced. Um, one of the things when you're looking, particularly when you're looking at um, almost like this, it's like this dark cloud that you need to be aware of. Anything you're doing with children, there's this, it's, it's this, this whole history of our, of our population around um, the stolen generation and child removal. It lingers there. So if you are working and if you're going, again, this comes down to will I trust you or not? 
if you're coming in and you start asking about children with disability and you haven't built that trust, we'll shut down. We'll shut down because will you set, if, you go, if you go in a way, even though your intentions might be good and noble, and, but if you sound like someone who's been there in the last 100 or so years saying exactly the same thing, then they'll connect that. So language and how you present yourself and how you behave to encourage trust and that trust building process is quite important. I'll just to come back to the quick statistics here, but I'll also tear it because part of my thing is actually whilst we have statistics, it's a story. And where you saw that chart that I had about barriers to people um, in terms of accessing things, when I looked at the statistical data, Every single category that I looked at, except one exception, had that pattern. Whether it was in education, whether it was the ability to get a job, whether it was in the justice sector, whether it was getting transport. Every single category that I looked at, except one which I'll get to in a moment, had that notion of isolation. So again, if you're looking at people with disability, when I talk about ableism, that's this notion of othering. So people were telling me that they would go to a cafe and they would say, look, I want to I order a coffee. But the waiter would talk to the person this side and this side. And they would go, what, what does this person want? It was like this, I don't know how to talk to this person. And I've had a personal experience of that because um, I, I was contacted by a group of year nine students uh, a few months ago. And they wanted to interview me for uh, a project that they were doing on people with disability. And we had a really good talk. But one of the questions they said, which kind of broke my heart a bit, he just sort of said, oh, oh, is it okay for us to talk to people with disability? And it kind of broke my heart in a way because I thought, oh, how conditioned they were to kind of have that kind of othering happen at such a young age. But then I thought, they've probably asked a question that many people are thinking and not saying because it is very difficult when we see the notion of, and I call it a centre point of social awkwardness, where people just struggle to actually connect with people with disability on, in a way that they would want to. And it's, and it's how, again, it's conditioned. People don't realise it. It's like, oh, how do I talk to you? How do I talk to you being deaf? Do I talk slowly? It's that kind of thing. Now, there are some examples where I actually talk to people. Again, if you have the you know, racism and the ableism and you think about how perceptions of people with alcohol um, and the Aboriginal community, uh, those sort of public prejudices combined with something like disability. There was an Aboriginal man with cognitive impairment. He said, I can't go shopping because the security guard um, won't let me in because he thinks I'm drunk. I don't drink, but the way that his cognitive impairment presents in public combined with the prejudices about alcohol consumption, basically you can't go to, a, you can't get a meal at a place. He just gets that. So what happens is that these people, it's like the social walls. Now, a hundred years ago, again, we were locking these people up in Australian society was locking people with cognitive impairment in institutions and they're actually they're horribly called idiot houses. But if you have a look at where, what's happening now, those social walls are still there. They're still isolated. They might be in a, in a house that no one's getting to. So we're really talking about it. And, and I've heard people talk about this morning about the frustration and the vicious circle. So this is how I talk about it. It's actually a pathway to self-exclusion. And it starts off, I call it apprehended discrimination. The reason I call it apprehended discrimination, think of it's like a fear, apprehensions of fear. It's not like you're getting locked up, but it's the fear. I, I expect... I fear and I expect I will be discriminated against. And this is how it starts. It starts off with this intuitive, oh, hang on, this isn't going to go well because I've seen other people being discriminated against, so it's probably going to happen to me. And what happens is they go to the next step and it actually does start happening to them. So they go, oh, hang on, my intuitive fear is now realised. It's actually quite rational for me to think that I'll be discriminated against because it's actually happening to me. So what's the rational response to that is they self-exclude. So that's where I think this notion of this pathway down. Now, again, so some of the examples that I give here, it's one that the, the most straightforward on the top. It talks about disability access. And this all come from people's testimony who said, tell us your story. We didn't ask them 
this. They just said, tell us what barriers you face in life. We didn't ask about this. This is all self-disclosed and volunteered. So the top one talks of an, el an Aboriginal elder. He goes, oh, I get invited to all these to be an advisory committee because I'm a, an elder. And I said, I kind of think, oh, should I go or not? Because it's probably not disability access. He, he's an amputee and in a wheelchair, so he needs mobility access. Then he says, oh, well, I turn up to these places and they don't have disability access, so I don't go again. That, that's a very straightforward pathway. But it also happens in everyday life too. So one of the things that I saw was in the employment. And I interviewed a 19-year-old a Torres Strait Islander girl. And um, she's beautifully spoken on the phone, writes eloquently doing two degrees at university. She has cerebral palsy, so she's walking frames. And she told me that um, uh, she, when she goes for jobs, like the Westfield type jobs, she turns up for interviews and she's told, I don't fit the brand. So she goes, well, why should I bother? So it's that notion of exclusion. The one exception that I have, if I can go for just about three more minutes more, um, is Aboriginal people with disability participate in their own culture, their own community. So when they're in their own community, they're participating. It's engaging outside their communities that the inequality in participation and access materialises. So again, this is like shifting the, shifting the mindset here. I put this chart up because we, part of the interviews we did were with uh, deaf, linguistically deaf. So it was done in Auslan, so it was about 11. And this was a group that we had where um, the Auslan interpreter was unavailable at very, very short notice the morning we were gonna do it. So what we have here is so the participant there, that's the one with the back to us. We couldn't show her for privacy reasons. But the two Auslan interpreters were via Skype. So one was sitting in a Brisbane office, one was sitting in a Sydney office. We were in Adelaide there, and we had the, the thing there. I mean, we just do this kind of stuff. But the reason we want to show this is about, look, if you value inclusion, you value access, and you're not prepared to compromise, you can actually make pretty much anything happen. So. I just quickly want to close up with, um, I might bypass this one, coming back. Um, we, we've actually, this actually, we put this in a book, um, which people can come to our website and, and look at it, or, or we encourage people to get it from their library. But what this is, it tells the people stories, but it does something else. It actually gives you a permission slip. When you see things that are isolating, and this is the dare that I presented to you at the start, you actually need to practice inclusion. And you kind of need to practice it on the terms of the people who you want to include. This is your permission slip though, that if you see things and you kind of get you to think, am I doing something that's actually subconsciously excluding people? Or if I do see something that excludes people, put your hand up and go, thank you, not on my watch. I'm not gonna do that. So that's me for today, because I think everyone's followed this single line footprint here to hear that and hear the story of inclusion. So I'd just like to thank you all, and I can take questions. Thank you very much, Scott. Really appreciate it. Um, we, we only have time for a, one or two questions. Uh, is that okay, Lydia, if we just, if we dive into a couple of questions? Thanks, Scott, again. For, I think the opportunity to learn from your culture is just fantastic at the moment. It's really hard for us to understand the better ways that you do many things. So thank you for sharing with us. I think it's fantastic. I'm happy to hang around. I've, what I do find, this can be actually quite confronting to people. Absolutely. So I hang around for morning tea. Have you got time for morning tea with us? Okay. Tell me their story. I'm, I'm very happy to. Well, that was great. Now, you said we can see the book at the library. Ooh. Can we buy the book? So you can buy the book. I um, need to warn people it's textbook price because um, we weren't actually funded to do this. So you can go on. It's $172, I think, on our website. But we're encouraging people to go to their community library and saying, you might like to buy it if mm. you can't afford it. But we've, we've written it, it's got images, it's got beautiful images in there. It's actually designed, the designer designed books for art galleries. 
So it's designed as what I call the thinking person's coffee table book that they can leave on their coffee table, remind them and encourage discussion as well. But um, people who are associated with universities or that, we're encouraging people that they might get their university to buy it or even their local library. Right, I think that's a wonderful opportunity. Um, thank you very much again. Now, you'll remember that, as I started to say before, I'm sorry, um, morning tea, everything's happening on this level here. So if you come down the stairs, you've got the level, the morning tea will be out through the gate door over there in the left-hand corner, and the toilets are out there, and there's a, a disabled toilet as well. That's for morning tea. For lunch, we'll be going out there. We'll actually be going up in the lift. So now you're welcome to come down and go across here. Um, the ABC has security issues, of course, and so we're very keen to respect the opportunity to be here and to make sure that we don't try and stray into places where we may not be welcome. Um, thank you very much. Sorry, just want to mention one thing. Uh, the, you do have Wi-Fi access and um, uh, the, that Wi-Fi access is on the back of your card. But it's W. Uh, the Wi-Fi is a capital A capital B capital C underscore Aussie way with a lowercase e. Okay, the password there is, is is there as well, which is Aussie way, spelt the same way underscore two zero one eight. If anybody wants some help with that during the break, just come and grab me. You've also been sent an email which has got the YouTube the live YouTube streaming link, so check your emails as well. Thank you. And morning tea is served.